I guess a, a good way to get started is uh, either at your former job or your current job, what does your um, lymph angiography practice look like? Which kind of patients are you taking care of? I, I got a lot of questions about it, but I'll just open it up. Like, what, what does the practice look like for you right now? Absolutely. Um, you know, everywhere I've been uh, along my path, the lymph angiography practice has been there. I think that's really one of the the salient points to really make is that I've never had to try hard to build a lymph angiography practice. It's there and uh, the patients uh, need the help. The Really, the biggest thing is the visibility of, is there somebody there with the know-how, the willingness to take it on? I can't think of a single medical center, community hospital, academic hospital, private practice, et cetera. You know, if you're servicing a hospital that even has 100 patients, 100 beds, for instance, you can't tell me that they don't do a lymphadenectomy or, or uh, any type of prostate surgery, uh, spine surgery, et cetera. And all of these things are, are where you can run into lymphatic things. How they get managed? Well, do they can they be managed by you or do they need to be sent elsewhere? And the reality is almost all of these things can be managed by an interventionist who is interested in doing it. And I think anytime we can solve a problem for a colleague in our hospital, that's a natural way to build a practice. Sure. How did you yourself get interested in it specifically? Because a lot of IRs, like this is at least one of the reasons we wanted to cover this topic is we feel like this can be a blind spot, not only in training, but just sometimes it's, you know, your interventional radiologists sometimes are asked to do a lot of things. And sometimes it's an easy one to say, oh, you know, I'm just not going to make this part of the practice, right? Sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, a great deal of it uh, goes back to my own training. And I did my residency at uh, Brigham and Women's, which is one of the few places that was still doing pedal and vein geography, along with the University of Pennsylvania, was uh, one of the places where thoracic duct embolization was done um, back in the early 2000s. And it was largely because we had a population of patients with mesothelioma. And we were international center for mesothelioma patients who would come in. They'd have these large extrapleural pneumonectomies, et cetera. Invariably, they have great outcomes from a mesothelioma standpoint, or at least as good as you could imagine. Um, but they would ha have complications with lymphatic injuries. You know, you want to get those patients back on chemotherapy. You want to maintain the nutrition. You need to do all this stuff. And a chylus leak or a thoracic duct injury isn't, isn't going to allow that to happen. And you can imagine that the desire to go in and reoperate on somebody where you've just maybe put intrapleural, uh, intracavitary chemotherapy, et cetera, is, is non-existent. And so I remember actually it was my first rotation in IR. I was a first year resident and the IR fellows all were kind of shying away from this case because they knew, you know, back in the old people sure. in geography days, it's going to be four or five hour plus right. case. It's and a while. They all, they all jumped into other cases and like, oh, hey, this is a, a great first case for you, for you to do. Yeah, first year resident. What else? <laughs> Pedal of <laughs> geography. So I go in, you know, of course, the, the attending does almost all of it. I'm doing my best to not screw things up. And we end up doing this case. And it was, it was so transformative to see that have seen the patient before, you know, who's A, not eating, B, has chest tubes in, is losing all this vital fluid. And, you know, a day later is functionally cured. I mean, and then seeing it again and again, whether it's for esophageal surgeries or cabbages or post spinal surgeries, et cetera, you know, we did quite a few at Brigham and Women's. You know, along that time span, um, 2011 at Children's Boston, I also rotated there. They had moved from doing pedal and fangiography because you really can't do it in these really tiny kids. Um, and they had gone along with nodal and fangiography, which is kind of a blast from the past in the 1950s and 60s. And they used that as a way to easily access the lymphatics and do your lymphangiography. And we started doing it in adults and it made things even so easy. By the time I was a senior resident and a fellow, and we were doing these very often in several week, many cases. Wow. Um, before things really caught on um, and started spreading. So in, in a way, I, I got to see this uh, lymphatic revolution where it went from a really challenging procedure that was only done at a couple places to something that could be easily within the armamentarium of any IR anywhere and to great effect. And, you know, what's really continued to change is, you know, we moved beyond just thoracic duct embolition, but there's so many other types of lymphatic interventions. And I think that's really where the excitement is that, you know, you can start with just lymphangiography, but where you branch off and, and where it goes is, is tremendous. Out of curiosity, I've never seen or performed pedal lymphangiography. <laughs> how, lo how long actually does it take? Um, hours. Okay. Hours, you know, and, and uh, there's a skill to it for sure. 
you know, not just even injecting like the, the dye between the toes to try to do it as painlessly as possible for patients. And then, you know, you're milking that blue dye into the dorsum of the foot and then, you know, cutting down on these little skinny vessels and cannulating with a 30 or 32 gauge needle. And, you know, it's something that is somewhat lost on us because to a certain degree, we do these bigger actions with much bigger needles, mm -hmm. you know, thoughtlessly. But, you know, historically in the, in, in the earlier days of lymphangiography, 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera, you know, a lot of the techs that we work with became so proficient that they would do a lot of the pedal lymphangiograms themselves. Um, and I know even here, uh, I remember them telling me that, oh yeah, some of our senior techs used to, used to do uh, these and they used to do them fairly quickly. And I was like, wow, you know, because that skill was lost right between the 80s, 90s, and 2000s because it went from lymphangiography being there as a diagnostic modality to stage cancer, or to differentiate infection from inflammation and malignancy, et cetera, to, you know, CTs and MRRs around. Who wants to do a lymphangiogram, you know, that isn't as sensitive or as, or as good? Never mind the time and the potential complications with an incision, et cetera. So it passed away with time. And um, now it's really been revived, not from a pedal standpoint, sure, but sure, from sure. a from a standpoint of, you know, re-exploring how the lymphatics interact with the pathophysiology we may be treating.